So good evening. Uh, my name is Spencer Stewart. I'm a chair of the Alcuin Society. And uh, you're joining us to, for the April 2022 uh, virtual presentation. Uh, just before we get underway, I noticed some of the registrants are, are some new names and, and uh, non-members. So I thought I'd take, the, uh, take a moment just to talk about the society briefly before, before tonight's uh, session. Now, the Alcuin Society was founded in 1965. It's the only nonprofit organization in Canada that's dedicated to the entire range of interests related to uh, books, uh, reading, bookmaking, and, and these sorts of matters. Now, M4, the Society's journal, is published three times per year and covers topics that include authorship, publishing, book design, book production, the history of the book, libraries, ephemera, book selling, really you name it, it's the whole gamut. To further our aims, the Alcuin Society engages in a wide variety of educational activities, such as the lecture you're attending this evening, uh, exhibitions, uh, and as well as field visits uh, when we can. And this is connected with uh, a number of different organizations, including Simon Fraser, University of British Columbia, Emily Carr, and, uh, and other organizations and other universities. Uh, the Alcuin Society's annual awards for excellence in book design in Canada uh, is the only competition of its kind that recognizes and celebrates uh, the art of book design in Canada. And, uh, and the winners of this award represent the nation at the international exhibitions and competitions in both Frankfurt uh, as well as Leipzig. And we exhibit uh, across the country. And we're happy to announce that uh, this year with the uh, conclusion of the 2020 and 2021 uh, adjudications, we will be having exhibits. So stay tuned and keep an eye on, uh, on the website for the announcements of various universities in which we'll be having uh, exhibits. Uh, now, if, uh, if you're not a member of the society, we encourage you to visit our site and consider becoming a member today. Uh, and I will be putting a link in the chat. So. Uh, Please, uh, please come in and have, have a look at what, what we have to offer and some of the other events that we have. Uh, this evening would be, of course, uh, not possible without the, uh, the work and organization of Gina Page, the uh, programs director for the Alcuin Society. So many thanks to her in putting together this organization, uh, putting together this event for tonight. Uh, now, without further ado, I will hand it over to Chester Grisky. Uh, what we'll do is later on in, in, the, uh, in the session, we'll open it up to questions. So please, if you have any, uh, put them into the chat and, and we'll make sure to get to them uh, at the conclusion of their conversation. So I will, uh, I will transfer it over to Chester and Will Reuter and, uh, and make sure that the introductions and, and thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this year marks the 60, 60 years since Will Reuter began the Alquando Press. As a private printer, Reuter plays many roles, publisher, designer, artist, illustrator, compositor, printer, and binder, and excels in all aspects of bookmaking. Reuter has produced over a hundred uh, has produced 120 books and over 90 broadsides, and I don't think I'm letting the cat out of the bag to let you know that he's really not finished. The other day, I saw him setting type uh, by hand for the hundred the 121st book. The subject matter of his books and broadsides reflect his interests in music the book arts and poetry. And his books have won many awards in both in Canada and internationally. Reuter has received the Alcuin Society's Robert R. Reed Award and medal in 2013. And sitting beside me is Will Reuter this evening. Now, Will, you design handset print and bind. In this scheme, where does deciding what to print fit? Do you start with a design idea and then look for a text to fit that idea? How do you do it? 
I ask myself that every time I start something. Um, for me, the text is important. Here. The word is absolutely sacrosanct. Um, Claudio Monteverdi, the great Renaissance composer, had three rules. Words first, rhythm second, music third. And I think that's uh, a rule that uh, uh, printers should follow. The word is absolutely um, the most important part of the book. So the text has to be considered um, <clears throat> well before any design comes into it. I'm, I'm not good at talking, so I just wanted to give you an example of um, a design problem that I had to solve. And once I solved it, I could go ahead. Um, there's a lovely poem called Sure on This Shining Night by James Agee, the American writer. And uh, the first eight lines are very short. The last two lines are extremely long. How do you fit them on a page? So I thought about this for quite a while. I really wanted to do this as a broadside. And what I did eventually was put an illustration, a reductive line of cut, on the right side, which more or less balances the full length of the, uh, uh, the last line. It's a very unusual way, I think, to write a poem, and it works, I think, reasonably well. This is also an attempt of mine to uh, try using some uh, uh, silver leaf. That's the sort of thing that you come up against, and uh, I think it works best when uh, you let the text dictate its own design. It's hard to say what that is. Um, where, the where the design comes from uh, can be anybody's guess. Sometimes it might be a piece of paper that I get. It might be a fabric or uh, a color and uh, a type ornament. Uh, it's an idea that sits there and then eventually it may gel into a, <clears throat> into a uh, broadside or into a book. But uh, I'm not, I don't necessarily uh, start with any design. I sort of work around the text. Uh, that's the best way I can think of describing it. Well, how do you find the text in the, how do you come up with the text that you're going to print? How, do you, <laughs> how does that happen? Yeah. I mean, how do you yeah. select the text? Maybe a better I think way everybody has their own way of doing that. Uh, again, this could be a reference. It could be a reference in a footnote. It uh, could be a line of a poem. It could be any number of things. One example, which uh, uh, just came to me today was, I worked uh, as a designer at the University of Toronto Press for almost 30 years. And uh, one of the manuscripts that was turned uh, in for a, a possible consideration was a book on uh, Colin McPhee, who was a Montreal born composer uh, he went to Bali in the Indonesia in the late 1930s. He uh, excited me because he annotated the gamelan music that is so typical of uh, Indonesia, of Bali in particular. And he has an enormous importance. He also wrote some composition based on that music. Uh, the University of Toronto Press had a, <clears throat> a wonderful opportunity to produce the book, but it wasn't quite... Canadian enough. So it would, the manuscript was rejected. I uh, <clears throat> had some slight contact with the author of the book and uh, met her in New York once. I said, is there anything at all that uh, hasn't been printed by, uh, hasn't been published uh, about Colin McPhee? She was the executor of uh, um, McPhee's musical estate, if you like. She had a bit of a copy and that's the, uh, the accordion fold. Okay, this never is... reproduced before, but uh, it was very exciting. Okay, so this is the the palm book. The palm book. Okay, so that's actually for those who can make it to Grimsby on exhibit in Grimsby, and it's sometimes just described as a, a as a quotation on that. But there's also um, his Bali diary that I put on exhibition. Oh which is more of Colin McPhee. More of Colin McPhee's. Yeah, actually, I'd forgotten. I, I have done two uh, previously unprinted uh, uh, texts. This is one of the exciting things about a private press. You can do wine labels. You can do 
Aunt Sally's jam labels, you can do business cards. But if you get serious and you feel like doing books, the world is right out there. There are so many possibilities to choose from. And uh, one of the things that I think is very important for people considering uh, operating a private press simply is poetry. It's, um, there are so many poets around. There are so many good poets who will never see the light of day. And uh, poetry doesn't use up as much type as, uh, as prose. <laughs> so <laughs> it's the ideal thing. Do, do a couple of sheets of poetry or do a small book of poetry. So has your design, uh, design style changed over the years, would you say, or have you? <clears throat> when I started um, designing, I really was a very conservative designer. I worked in a very conservative field. I think book design has opened up quite a bit over the years, um, but there's lots of room for traditional design. And the nature of what I was doing at University of Toronto Press was fairly conservative design. Uh, but there was, lot, was lots of experience, uh, there were lots of possibilities to fool around with type as I gradually developed a small library of different type styles. Uh, our mutual friend, Glenn Galuska, uh, just came at it gangbusters mm -hmm. and started with sans serif wooden type. So he got me very excited about the possibilities of thinking large and thinking bold and thinking strong. And when I got my own wood type and a big enough press, I was very happy to go in that direction. So it's a simple thing like having a larger press and having larger alphabets uh, and larger typefaces really made a difference. Now, you were hired by Alan Fleming, the designer Alan Fleming uh, at the U of T Press. Did that, how did that impact sort of the your private. design? <laughs> your, yes, the private press idea. Yeah, well, as I say, uh, <clears throat> doing books, which I absolutely loved, for the first 10 years, shall we say, of uh, University of Toronto Press. And that was about the period that Alan was, was working there. Um, doing books with Alan was an astonishing experience. Alan had a very clean sense of design. He'd started in advertising, so he knew how to do the big, grand, amusing, clever stuff. He also had a very unique mind, which was able to find humor in a lot of design. And uh, his, he also did a great deal of research on historic design. So he was able to bring a lot of this to his own work. And I, I think I picked up a little, at least, of that, uh, that tradition. Um, in the 1920s, we had people like Jan Schichold who said, oh, this is garbage, get rid of it. Let's break through, let's do asymmetrical design. Um, Mondrian's paintings are a prime example of that. Just throw it out. The, the Russian constructivist school, you know, very, very strong. Mm. <clears throat> Sometimes there's not much subtlety, but it really was a great uh, starting point. And then after the war, uh, Jan Chico was working with, uh, and also Hans Schmoller, I think, mm. at Penguin Books. They, were, they were, went right back to the classical small things with the cartouches and the ornaments, and they were very happy doing that. So if you have a feel for either direction, it helps as certainly uh, when I was, uh, when I had a large enough press, I was able to fool around with big stuff and take some of that energy, I hope that visual energy to some of the books that I did at the press and bring some stuff back. So it was a very nice uh, uh, correlationship with design. So does now between books and broadsides, is it the same thing or are they, are they really fundamentally different in design terms? In design terms, they're not much different. I think the text is still incredibly important with the broadside. The intent is a little bit different in that I have regarded um, broadsides in a way as five finger exercises. You know, you do the basics before you jump into Bach or uh, Shostakovich. <clears throat> Uh, so these were little experiments at first. The very first press that I had um, would only print, allow me to print about a four by seven inch area, but I could do broadsides very carefully because I could hang the paper over the side on three sides. Mm -hmm. 
So my first broadside was literally flipping the paper <laughs> upside down and getting as much mileage out of it as that. Uh, this was this, broadsides have been my uh, area of experimentation, and sometimes I've done a broadside, thought that's an interesting idea, shoved it aside because I, I look on my broadsides as ephemera, and then uh, a couple of years later think, well, I could do something with that in a book. Yeah. So the broadsides do feed into uh, into the books sometimes. So you hand set your type. Yeah, I've never done that. What's it like to hand set? Isn't it boring? Doesn't it just drive you <laughs> up the wall? Uh, there are two ways of looking at that. If I'm setting type to make all the lines equal, justified, um, it's pretty tricky because mm -hmm. you can set as far as you can go on one line, but you're never going to quite fill it. So you have to put spaces in. Mm -hmm. And in order to fill that line, you have to put spaces between the words. Mm -hmm. That's boring. Mm -hmm. So for many years, I have been setting unjustified mm -hmm. type, where the, the right-hand margin is very ragged. <laughs> it's a cheat, uh, but it actually allows me to make corrections very easily. And it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, setting type is like knitting. Yeah. You know, you just do it and it's very, it's a, a process. I'm sorry, I'm just gonna get some water. It's a process that's very meditative and very relaxing. The only problem is that after a couple of hours, your left hand gets very, very stiff. <laughs> so you've never taken on machine setting like linotype or no, monotype, no. setting that Glenn Galuska. Oh, Glenn, Glenn excelled at uh, linotype. He was able to get typefaces that uh, even now we, we know he probably didn't use. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he was an expert at linotype. He could literally whiz through uh, that. I didn't have the physical wherewithal to set up a shop with linotype. You mean the size, a, a room big enough? A room, a linotype takes up a lot of space. A monotype caster takes up even more. And I don't have the technical mm -hmm. ability to handle something like that. So the type in my hand has worked very well. So in terms of setting your text, now I think people today are going to their computers designing on their pages and coming up with at the end having uh creating a polymer plate of which they then print letterpress how do how does that strike you i think it's great <laughs> uh, polymer plates are not inexpensive <clears throat> and i think if you make a mistake on the page you have to obviously correct that page that comes out in polymer uh, but as a technique, it's absolutely fine. As electrotype uh, cuts were, mm. and you know how much we uh, enjoy or have enjoyed the uh, Iranian press, yes. which was running about the time of uh, Morris and uh, Cobb and Sanderson, very much inspired by them. The very first book that uh, they that uh, Lucien Pissarro did was simply writing and having electroplates uh, made, and then printing. A, um, a wood engraving within that area. Okay. That's so tricky. I knew that very often wood engravings, to, to make sure that the wood engraving wasn't damaged during the printing, they would make a, they would make electrotypes and then use the electrotypes to actually print the edition and hold back the, uh, and hold back the actual blocks. But I wasn't aware that Pizarro did he, this in that only in his first book, he wrote the text, which in my view makes him very personal, like William Blake, who was basically doing much the same thing. Uh, the register, the, the fitting uh, of the block would have had to be very carefully uh, considered. So you, so. You've used uh, a variety of presses. You started with an Adana, you used a Chandler and Price Pilot Platten, You've used a Poco, Poco proof press and mm -hmm. a Vandercook uh, and a Vandercook. How does the various presses are they are they different or, or what's it like? Uh, I don't pretend to be a, an authority on presses. It's the the least exciting part of the operation. Um, 
a platen press basically is um, a bed of the press. The, um, <clears throat> the type is locked in and goes against this. But in my view, the difficulty is that it's not hitting dead on mm -hmm. in all four corners. So type will get worn. You have to be very, very good pressman to get the press set up so that the four corners um, of the type bed, uh, of the type uh, platen rather, are going in the right spot. A cylinder press is just like a rolling pin over a flat surface. And it takes up about as much space as a rolling pin would on dough, about a 16th to an eighth of an inch going right across that. So there's not the same kind of pressure. And uh, it, it, to me, it's uh, a much easier way of doing things, probably less damage to the type. And uh, because you're locking on a flat surface and not having to put this uh, chase into the press itself, uh, you don't have to move around things as much. So have you ever thought, ever wanted to have an Albion or one of those other sort of classic sort of hand oh, presses? Oh, oh, oh. I would love to have had one in my early days. It would have been fun. There were, there are small Albion presses. Carl Dare had one at, at Massey College. There's a place in Oakville called the Howard Iron Works. And if you ever have a chance to go to Oakville, you will see about my guess is at least a hundred restored Albion, Columbia, Washington presses. It's a press museum and they specialize in restoring presses. Um, there are some absolute beauties there. You know, the little lavender painted one with the roses, mm -hmm. the great hunking um, dark green one with the black uh, decorations. Mm -hmm. They're lovely, they're really lovely, but uh, no, I, I, I have been very happy with my, my cylinder press. No. To a beginning printer, what would you sort of recommend they consider obtaining as their first private, as their first printing press? Uh, the first press that I used was a uh, tabletop platen press. Uh, it was an Adana made in England, and it did a fairly good job. I mean, I was I was able to do a small book one page at a time by printing the pages on their side. Uh, the same thing was uh, true of the, the other, the second press, which was a CMP pilot press. I don't know what presses will be available, and I don't know what is going to happen in the future, because all of this equipment is totally obsolete. It's been obsolete since about the 1980s, when people started getting serious about, uh, uh, about private printing. Uh, if you were in a position to form a consortium, of some sort, and you could all uh, pitch in and buy a platen press, I'm sorry, buy a cylinder press, that would be ideal. If you could buy somebody's workshop, which had lots of type, that would be ideal. But at this point, I don't know where you could start. I honestly don't. Yeah. So the, now you also uh, bind your books by hand. Why, why did you sort of take on binding? Uh, because I thought I should do it all myself. I, I really believe that uh, the act of private printing is a very personal expression. Um, the kind of binding that I have done virtually for all of the major books I've done in the last years is a three-piece uh, binding. That is the cloth, with a cloth spine, decorated papers, which are wonderful, a way to do things, Japanese pattern papers, perhaps cloth, and a very simple label at the top. This is more or less a German style of binding and hopefully fairly thin boards. It's a German style of binding and it suits me very well. Within that, those parameters, I can do a lot. <clears throat> if I'm doing a more experimental binding, I might change things. But this is basically what we see on a shelf. And this gives me an opportunity to have the book as a kind of gateway to protect the content mm -hmm. and to invite the reader inside. So for me, binding is very important. Uh, Ed, but you've not simply restricted yourself to that kind of standard codex 
format of binding. I mean, I certainly in preparing the exhibition, I came across a, a number of accordion fold or concertina oh, yes. <laughs> fold bindings, which were spectacular. Yeah. Uh, 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 spectacular in a number of ways. Yeah. I think the accordion fold book is a wonderful way of doing things. It has a tradition in Japan, I believe. And uh, <clears throat> certainly since about the 1980s, again, there have been wonderful binders like Hetty Kyle, and the uh, Canadian bookbinders and book artists guild known as Cabbage has encouraged a lot of experimental binding. Uh, this is a book that I did. Um, <clears throat> I planned it very carefully because I was I'm going to have a cataract operation and I wanted to do a book that would be easy to do uh, so that I could see, mm -hmm. not knowing what the outcome would be, uh, the letters would be large enough. So the basic book is in uh, uh, with wood type. And as you can see, there are two different uh, sizes of paper. <laughs> One contains a text. I'm sorry, I'm gonna hold it up here. Mm. <clears throat> the, uh, the shorter uh, pages, are a text by Rabbi Alafia, I believe, who I think was the 13th century rabbi. And he was very concerned about calligraphy. Sorry if I go on a bit. Uh, he was very concerned about calligraphy. You should light a candle. You should wear white clothes. You should look on the letter form as absolutely sacrosanct. This might help a bit. So of course you can turn pages and you can stretch it out for as long as you want to stretch it. And the trick here, which you won't be able to see that well, is that the letters, the big letters spell the word print. Mm. There's an R, yeah. I, yeah. et cetera. The big letters spell the word print, which gives a basis for the collage, if you like, the collage letters. And on the edge, um, we have, This is hard to show you. We L, whoops, E, T, etc. So the, the edge letters, which are folded, form the word letters. And then, of course, you can stretch the whole thing out. So now let's talk about printing this because how many colors? I mean, oh, I just you? kept I just kept printing. Once I realized I'd be able to see, <laughs> I just printed and I tried to make connections with the letters and use whatever colors came to hand. So there's no logic to the colors, but the, uh, uh, the hidden text is, was the fun here. But each, but each different color is a, a run, separate run, run on the press. press. Let me just okay. check this. Uh, 30 copies done in 19, 2013. Yeah, Rabbi, Rabbi Abraham, Abu Lafia, I beg your pardon. He was a Jewish mystic who believed that through meditation and the observation and creation of letter forms, uh, through this, the devout might find union with God. I'm all for him. Uh, but, but I just sort of, this, the whole sort of operation of having all of this number of times through the press how do you make sure you get the, the letter and the color right where you want it? <laughs> uh, there's a certain amount of uh, uh, judgment there and there's a constant terror of miscalculation. <laughs> uh, I, that's all I can say. You waste a lot of paper sometimes. Sometimes if you're very lucky, the wastage isn't too bad but it's all in calculating the space that will happen around the next bit of detritus in the press. Well, why do you go through so much work to make so few copies, like 30 copies yeah. uh, of this particular book, but you've described quite a bit of work. I don't know how long it actually took you this to was do about, that printing. Yeah, this was about two to three months, as I remember. Um, there is no logic. Um, I would be very bored if I did more than 40 or 50 copies. 
because there are so many other books I'd like to do. I want three more lifetimes <laughs> to do. Mm -hmm. You know, I've barely scratched the surface after 60 years, and uh, I will be closing down the press this year to my great regret because uh, I just, my eyesight isn't that great. My hands aren't great. It's time to do it. Uh, but uh, I would love to continue in many, many ways. It's a lot of fun. Uh, Daniel Berkeley Updike described it as serious play. Uh, San Coven Sanderson talked about order touched with delight. I think that's what it says. It, it's serious and it's also fun. Well, didn't also John Ryder in Printing for Pleasure talk about Oh, so the pleasure, the of, pleasure aspect. Yeah, it's almost being essential. But he wasn't in the studio and he didn't hear the words that I sometimes <laughs> use when it's not pleasure. <laughs> now, I would say 90% of the time, there's such satisfaction when you see the paper go into the press, you turn the handle, you know that you've done everything you can for the author of the word, and then the first sheet comes out. It's, you know, after all these years, I still get a terrific uh, thrill out of seeing that. So this has actually got nothing to do with selling the books. No. Uh, in an ideal world, I would love to give everything away. As soon as you get into the problem, and it really is a problem of putting a price on books, something that I really can't do very well. Uh, I need expert advice from other people to do that. As soon as you get into that, you're dealing with marketing, distribution, cash sales, uh, check sales, whatever. And it's it's beyond me. The fun for me is making and having one copy that I think, you know, is okay. It's not the, it's not great, but it's the best I could do. And that's another book in my library. <laughs> so, I mean, after operating a private press for so many years, and you, I mean, aside from sort of when you use those words that you didn't want to repeat, I mean, are there any regrets in sort of 60 years of being a private printer? Yeah, uh, yeah. There are there's a few books that I regret having done as badly as I've done them. Um, there are a few orphans among the children. <laughs> they shouldn't be there. So, so badly <laughs> means poor design or poor really, execution? Really poor execution. A couple of books where the design could have been a little, a little perkier, uh, a little better. I'm always very much aware of, of, of my printing because I'm not a particularly good printer and I mess up binding. Uh, so I'd like, to, I'd like to have gotten it better. Um, there are a number of personal regrets. Of course, this has taken time away from the, some of the ordinary things in life. But I was a bachelor for many years, and it kept me very happy and allowed me to have a sense that I was doing something that I thought was worthwhile. And I still think is worthwhile. It does, it does uh, shake you up sometimes. I heard stories about you because when you were designing for U of T Press, it was on the St. George campus. Yeah. And you lived several blocks away. And I kept hearing stories that you would leave the U of T Press at lunchtime and go home and, and cycle like some, hell, uh, uh, distribute a few uh, lines of type like, or get things ready, cycle back yeah. and then uh, go back. It, 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 if you take it seriously, or if it, you let it happen in such an intense way, and I think I've been fairly intense, it can dominate uh, your life. Mm. But it's a wonderful sense of, uh, of achievement when you've done mm. a book. No, so you were, uh, you were the founding, the founding ever editor along with Glenn Galiska and Paul Forage of The Devil's Artisan. And you've actually fitted in a lot of writing about private presses and other people's work because you've reviewed books. Yeah, I've done a bit of it. How did that play into what you were going to print? It didn't really, but uh, <clears throat> because I did some reviewing for a couple of um, journals, an American journal called fine print, I think I did maybe three or four reviews. Um, I got a little more confident. I'm not a natural writer and uh, I don't think of myself as a writer, but
but I found it was really exciting to look at a book to try to go into the mind of another private printer. What were they trying to do? What had they achieved? And you know, was, it, was the book okay or not? So that gave me a better sense of judgment for my own work, I think. And when I did this, uh, starting probably in the 1970s, <clears throat> excuse me, um, there was a great movement of private presses right across Canada, mm -hmm. a lot of American private presses. Magazines like Fine Print were a tremendous inspiration uh, for new information, um, contacts. I met a fellow called Paul Hayden Dunsing uh, in the mid 1970s, I think, just before I met Glenn. Mm -hmm. And um, he was an American uh, type designer, type caster. He cast his own type. We, he and I but, became. But he also had an, another job that he, he actually had, earned yeah. his living from. He was, he was a display manager for a very large pharmaceutical company. So he had the advantage of going to Europe all the time, checking in at all these cities. And while he was there, he would just look up the local printer or the local binder. He had a, a vast knowledge of people who um, were in the trade, uh, both commercial and privately. And uh, he cast a number of typefaces uh, and would put them for, up for sale for, um, uh, private printers like me. He became a very good friend. We were very, uh, we have, I have boxes and boxes of his letters to me. And uh, it's tragic that he, he died a few years ago. Uh, but uh, people like that uh, came into my life and added so much to the private press experience. So I wasn't always working in the dark. But you actually did uh, a collaboration with it. One of the yeah. one of the uh, uh, Alequando Press books is this collaboration, of which yeah. you did, they're sort of like mini broadsides. They are mini you broadsides. Did half, yeah. You did half, and he did the other half. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the book is called Buchstabenfreude, uh, and uh, I think it means the love of books. And uh, <clears throat> because Paul. Uh, knew a number of languages, including German, very well. Um, he was able to translate and print and help to, uh, to give me some mm -hmm. copy as well. Some of the writings of Rudolf Koch, who was a great German type designer and calligrapher and binder and tapestry maker and everything. And so we made this lovely little portfolio of, I think, 30 broadsides, uh, half printed by him half printed by me. Uh, the joke is that it's the first, uh, uh, possibly the first collaboration between uh, a Canadian and an American private printer. And uh, without making too long a story, I went to Windsor one time by train. He came across from the States with a hat and a turned up overcoat, collar, collar turned up <laughs> overcoat. And we laughed ourselves silly. Then we exchanged things and uh, went our way. <laughs> Okay. It was wonderful. Yes. So, but he's not the only person that you've collaborated with. Tell us about, tell oh. a bit about collaboration okay. with other people. Yeah, collaboration is a lot of fun. I'm a terrible person that way because I get so involved in the idea of collaborating that I expect everyone to live with my level of intensity. Uh -huh. And it just doesn't work like that. But I've had some wonderful experiences. Uh, an American poet called Jan Schreiber. Uh, has collaborated with me. I've had a Dutch uh, <clears throat> writer, uh, uh, Willem Kamskutter, that's a difficult uh, name to pronounce, translated some early, the earliest medieval Dutch poetry known, which was practically German, but already the language is becoming Dutch. And I would be thanks to Paul making accents for it years ago, I was able to print the Middle High German uh, with Paul's accents uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, that was a great collaboration. One collaboration I do want to talk about, bear with me, is uh, that I'm very proud of, and I think uh, the other collaborators too, is Emblemata Amatoria, the famous uh, three-piece binding. Uh, this was a chance to show off, let's see if we can do this properly, chance to show off some of my type 
the title page. I hope you can see it. Uh, it's pretty uh, white here, but hopefully it'll work. Um, let's see. <clears throat> this is a really fine example. I think it's showing too blank. I don't know whether I'm going to turn this light see. off. Hold on. We'll do this. Uh, Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is a choice example of uh, me being able to show off some of the type that I was collecting. Um, Wes did some wood engravings for this. And the Wes text is, is Wesley, Bates. Wesley Bates. Yes. Here's one of his more erotic book engravings for the emblemata <clears throat> uh, amatoria. Um, the text was um, written by Jakob Katz, whose writing was, I think, kind of cheesy, but was right next to the Bible on the Dutch uh, shelves in the 17th century. And uh, this was an English translation that I found in an edition of Katz. And someone had translated it. It was obviously printed uh, by a Dutch printer, but uh, I think 1623. There's one without illustrations. I hope you can see that. Now, I heard stories about and you. And we had a lot of fun with this. You and uh, Bates meeting in the bus station in Hamilton. Oh, yes. I was, and, I was wearing and, my and the, and the fedora. People, and the people overhearing as you chuckled. Yeah. This is based on Rembrandt. I hope you can see it. Mm -hmm. Oops. Okay. Anyway, Wes, Wes was a wonderful collaborator. He, he's done some superlative wood engravings and uh, a very good personal friend. He's helped me through some uh, very tough times and uh, I'm very grateful that I was able to. But you also you know, did a Kafka with- uh, With Don with Taylor. Taylor, yeah. We haven't got that to show, mm -hmm. so. Um, Unfortunately, uh, that was a really interesting thing. Don Taylor made decorated paper for, I think, 13 copies of a short Kafka story. Um, I can't go into it, but as the mind of the narrator became more um, confused, I introduced a second typeface with the first typeface. By the time we got to the last page, all of the type, the three different typefaces were running off the page. Yeah. So, how, I mean, how did you decide who would, uh, the, uh, the conception of the book, how did you and Don Taylor work out what the ultimate book would look like? Well, Don gave me the paper, as I recall, and I said, I'm going to do this. And uh, we worked separately. Wes and I worked separately on that. Um, so really, I didn't see what West was doing until I was ready to print. Oh. And it was down to the wire because uh, this was to be done for Waze Goose. And it was well received, yes. <laughs> especially the engravings. OK, so we've talked quite a bit about that. What's your favorite Aliquando Press book? Well, again, I'm going to try. Uh, let's see if we can turn this light on. <clears throat> My favorite Aliquando Press book is not under the Aliquando Press imprint. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm just going to take a brief break here. During the Second World War, <clears throat> there were a number of Dutch printers who were very upset about the occupation um, of Holland uh, to the extent that uh, they, there was an underground press, an underground press movement. <clears throat> they would print, uh, resistance poems written by the Dutch. They would reprint literature because they were really, really concerned that a lot of literature, Jewish literature, among other things, and some Dutch uh, writers were going to disappear. So they produced books. They would do them in a common typeface. So it would be very hard to identify where the type came from. They did some beautiful, beautiful books with the last bits of good paper that they got before the Second World War. Uh, there was a press called the Five Pound Press because uh, I think they got the paper for five pounds <laughs> from England. So I was thinking about uh, putting myself in their shoes and uh, doing a book. My Dutch relatives uh, were quite remarkable. Uh, they hid a Jewish family. They hid a member of the resistance. 
And they were just ordinary people who said, you know, the, the cause is freedom and liberty, and we're not going to be shaken by it. What could I do to uh, make a kind of faux underground press book? So I made this, um, which is called Loneliness. I made it small so it would be about the size of a wallet. Um, the wallet so flap a, opened. So that's part of the design concept. That's part of the design concept, yeah. And uh, uh, the text is, I'll just flip through here, the title page. Can you see that? Uh, I'll turn this off again, sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Okay, the title page is uh, the word loneliness and varying uh, tints disappearing. The author is Bruno Schultz, who was a Polish writer of short stories. And uh, I continued the um, technique, if you like, of the disappearing uh, type uh, throughout the book, uh, sorry, throughout the opening, very simple type. And um, if I can find it, bear with me. A very simple <clears throat> disappearing line of cut of uh, Schultz, which was taken from a self portrait that he drew. And then an afterward about the reason. Uh, I like this book very much, obviously, for the subject matter. And if I were doing it now, I would probably try to print hundreds and hundreds of copies and sell it to the, uh, um, the public for the uh, Ukrainian war relief. Mm. I feel very strong. We're in a very bad period. And we have to protest in any way that we can. But this is the kind of thing that the Dutch did. And uh, I like this book for the subject matter, and I'm I'm not unhappy about the content, about the form rather. All right, yeah, we we do have a, a number of questions that have come in, so we'll we'll work through them uh, in the order of the appearance. Uh, just before we get underway, I, I put a link in the chat for everyone just to to remind them again of uh, of the exhibition that's taking place at the Grimsby Public Art Gallery, uh, curated by Chester uh, about Will's work um, through the period of time of 1962 through to 2022. So uh, absolutely uh, have a chance to go check that out. And uh, how, how long will it be up uh, roughly, Chester, you estimate? Until June the 5th with a possibility of extending it, I think to June 20th or so, but I don't, I'm not the one making the decision, and I don't know who's making the decision and when the decision will be made. So I think you need to get there for June 5th and go a second time afterwards <laughs> if you have an opportunity. And of course, a week Saturday, uh, April the 20th, is the Grimsby Ways Goose, which has been going since 1979. Will was there at the beginning. Um, and so I think it's 40 something years of, uh, of Ways Goose. So you can see both the printers and the exhibition on, on one occasion. Fantastic. Well, we will jump into the questions uh, and I'm gonna sort of jump around a, a little bit here. Now, we have here, uh, right off the bat, uh, what, what is the most unusual material you've printed on, Will? <laughs> I'd like to say seal skin, but that wouldn't work. Uh, that's one of the problems that I discovered early on. When I was beginning to print, I, I begged, I scrounged shamelessly to get whatever offcuts I could find of paper because I was fooling around. This wasn't a serious undertaking. I wasn't going to sell books. I was just having fun. Uh, when I got a little more serious, I experimented. Uh, I can't think of anything specific. Some of the uh, handmade papers have been very unusual to print on. Mm -hmm. If the ink isn't right or the paper isn't slightly absorbent, you have a terrible mess. But uh, I, I'm not the person to uh, ask about uh, 
unusual surfaces. <laughs> I have enough trouble printing on basic paper. <laughs> um, we have a question here. Of, uh, what inspiration led you to get deep into printing? And what is your hope for the impression that your printed texts have, both for yourself and for others? Oh, that's a wonderful question. Uh, I got into printing, and without going into a lot of autobiographical stuff, I got into printing because I lived in uh, London way back in 1960. Uh, I was green out of school. I was scared witless, uh, but I wanted to find a profession. I didn't know what I was going to do. I had the incredible opportunity of going to uh, the British Museum, going to the British uh, Library, the, sorry, it was then the King's Library. Mm -hmm. And there were these amazing manuscripts. And that year, the Book of Kells was, out, was brought out of Ireland for the first time, and they turned the pages every week. So I saw the Book of Kells. It was phenomenal. I didn't know what it was. All I knew is that it was a completely different world from the world that I'd had, I'd, I'd been part of, and I wanted to learn more. Um, eventually, I set up a press when I was um, at art school in my first year, and uh, I was so happy. I discovered that I wanted to design books. So um, one of the, the major influences in those days was a fellow called Charles Knowles, uh, K-N-O-W-L-E-S. He was a teenager who went to a, a private school in New England. He had some horrible leukemia-like disease, but he would go down to the local printer and he wanted to, he ended up printing the Psalm book of Charles Knowles. I think 13 very colorful pages with old wood type banged up and his own lino cuts. It is the most incredible book. It, I, I have a reproduction upstairs. It still gives me goosebumps to see it because he was so determined. He knew he was dying, he was determined to produce that book. That was an amazing influence on me. Uh, the other part of the question was, what inspires me to? It was, a, what, what are your, what, what is your hope for the impression that your printed text has, both on yourself and for others? I hope for the books that I have original uh, text in them, that they will be eventually seen and used. The, the Jakob Katz, for example, is really a very uh, important book and that uh, this obscure Dutch author has these aphorisms and uh, they're very charming and uh, I'd like people to read them. Anything, any poetry that I've done it by a poet who hasn't been uh, 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 published since then uh, are important. I hope people will look at some of my books down the road and uh, think well he wasn't a bad old fart <laughs> well, <laughs> he tried <laughs> well some of the some of the poetry has been sort of modern canadian poetry yeah and some I of it has been it sort that. of 50 16th and 17th century european poetry that nobody has seen in years yeah well some of the I, what i have liked to do is uh, when i was able to um get fonts with accents I love doing bilingual books. Mm -hmm. I don't understand a word of a language, but I love the, the sound of it. I love the feel of the uh, foreign language type in my hands. Mm -hmm. And I love facing pages of uh, type. I, I did a, <clears throat> I don't know how I got into this uh, uh, bilingual Dutch business, but there's a Dutch poet called Hadeweich, who uh, was roughly the time of Hildegard of Bingen. And she wrote po love poems addressed to God. And I printed some of those, finding the original Dutch and a translation, uh, which I slightly reworked a couple of times because I tried to make it sound a little better in English. And that was set in an unsealed typeface, mm -hmm. which um, it was the Book of Kells period. And I loved setting it and I loved the book. Um, that's a sort of bizarre sort of thing that that, as I say, one can do with a private press. But it also brings forward something that people, like nobody, very few people currently know about, and suddenly it's back. It's back, back out front. there, yeah. yeah, yeah. Which there. is a good thing for private printers mm -hmm. to achieve. 
What's your favorite typeface, uh, both for working with, as, as you say, and, and, and also for the impression, the, the, the look it has on the page? You could have both, I mean. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> I'm very envious of Glenn when I think of this, because uh, there's one typeface, no matter who produced it, no matter what foundry produced it, no matter how many weird cuttings there are that I like as a good all-purpose face, I'm going to jump sideways to say that illustration is very important in a book. It's very important for illustrators. If you do something like wood engraving, which I think is the ideal medium for book illustration, you need a fairly weighty, fairly heavy type to go with it, but it can't be so heavy that it looks clunky. Mm -hmm. um, the typeface that I like a lot is Jansen, which is a 17th century, possibly Hungarian born. Uh, German, Dutch uh, uh, variation uh, typeface. It is all the, the right things that I think a typeface could do. Glenn Galuska, darn it, had font, had uh, this on his linotype. The linotype cutting of Jansen is really quite good. I would love, and the, the size that he had was excellent. I wish he was around now so he could cast some type for me. Well, maybe. <laughs> some, <laughs> well, maybe we can ask Andrew Steves to do yeah. that. But actually, you just mentioned something that we really didn't talk about, is some of the books you've actually illustrated yourself, both with wood engravings and with lino cuts. So how did that come about? Well, I'm, uh, I'm not an illustrator. In a couple of instances, I thought, uh, like the um, this guy, I thought, uh, I really would like to do that myself. I'm not sure I'd want to um uh take that fun away from me working with wesley bates who is a superb wood engraver has been a lot of fun i have a wonderful wife who's a printmaker and she has really inspired me on a number of occasions to um to do some lino cuts um she's done uh some remarkable etchings and the etching process while it's a little different can work i think quite well sometimes as illustration She's got me very interested in printmaking, an area that I've always sort of been interested in. But uh, applied to book work, it's, uh, um, it can be very exciting. Anyway, Jansen, if anybody can get their hands on Jansen, go for it. <laughs> We've got a question here uh, regarding, it's really connected kind of with process, but uh, what variables do you think through while exploring the best way to give uh, expression to a particular text. So, you know, when you're sort of putting it all together, uh, wh what are some of the what are some of the things that change from one project to the other? You find, even if you you feel like you have a a formula. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> a purely mechanical thing is uh, the types the uh, type size. Um, if I'm doing a book and I think this would be great in a contemporary uh, typeface. Until recently, when I started to uh, dispose of my, uh, my material, I had maybe three or four typefaces that were contemporary. Mm. Um, <clears throat> the only way to find out if they'll work on a, a given uh, size, uh, say a six by nine page, is to set the longest line, see how it looks. Well, the line is going to, the poetry in this case, would have to turn over all the time. I've got to go to a smaller size, or I have to go to a typeface that has a smaller X height, that is the, the height of uh, the letter X. So sometimes that kind of variable goes in. If you are doing this on a computer, you can say, well, I don't like 12 point, I'll try 11 and a half point and it'll fit. Those are the things you can't predict until you're actually setting type. But uh, those variables uh, can happen. Design-wise, I've changed design so many times, it didn't feel right. In the end, it was cute. In the end, it was cheesy. You know, am I being too busy? Um, I wake up in, in the middle of the night time, sometimes thinking, did I put the T in immortal? <laughs> <laughs> or did I hyphenate the right line? You know, you worry about a lot of things if you take it seriously. And uh, it, can be a, it can be a taskmaster. Putting the tea in a mortal at the middle, waking up in the middle of the night to that is a, it's a dramatic. Oh, uh, you have no idea. <laughs> uh, we have a question here. 
Uh, David Carson said, don't mistake legibility for communication. What is your opinion on legibility in design work? Absolutely essential. No matter how cute you are, no matter how wonderful the page looks, if there isn't a love, enough space between the lines, you're not going to be able to read the type. In those good old days, when I worked at University of Toronto Press, um, we had to cram a lot of words on a page because that was a way of dealing with budgetary uh, restraints. And uh, the pages became so tight. In Germany in the 1920s and 30s, when they were starting to use the Roman alphabet, all of the descenders, you know, the hanging down parts of the P's and Q's and Y's were all made very short so that you could mush the type together without any leading. We've gone past that. Pick up any um, paperback novel nowadays that's been reasonably well uh, published and you'll find lots of space between the lines. So that kind of legibility helps. A face that isn't too fussy um, is obviously better than the face that is. We're not used to reading black letter, so I wouldn't set a whole book in black letter. On the other hand, medieval monks wouldn't be able to read Roman type, probably. Yeah. I you, hope that answers it. Yeah, no, absolutely. You, you'd mentioned a couple of collaborations, a couple of uh, projects you've done with people. A uh, question yeah. here is, uh, have you trained uh, under any other printers, uh, apprenticed or workshopped uh, during during your career? No, I have asked a lot of questions. Um, in a way, Glenn <clears throat> Galuska mentored me in some ways. And in some ways, I'd like to think I mentored mm -hmm. Glenn because I gave him a few design tips sure. for book design. But he was a magnificent printer. He and Roland Milroy, I think, are among the best mm -hmm. printers I've encountered because Glenn was meticulous. I'm an absolute slob. Glenn was meticulous and he really cared about mortising characters so that the overhanging T and the lowercase O in Toronto would fit. Um, doing things now, I'm not so fussy about that because I'm trying desperately to finish a book and I can't do the niceties. But uh, uh, I have never trained under a specific printer. I wish someone had been around when I was starting out. The yeah. one person, one printer that you did work with and sort of an early collaboration with Stan Bevington on a dare piece. That's right, but that was done with everybody doing things separately. Mm -hmm. ah. Yeah, it, uh, that kind of collaboration is the kind I've more or less been used to. Um, and in, in a way, collaborations are good if you just let the other person, mm -hmm. um, assume the other person has the knowledge don't tell them what to do. Don't art direct. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's back to your, your, your discussions of music. You know, uh, yeah. everyone plays the particular instrument, different, different parts in the yeah. project, for sure. Um, we'll finish off with a, a question here. And this is to do with, um, you know, connecting with your books and being able to, to source them here. Uh, I see you sell your books through Vamp and Tramp in the US. Are there any other sources? Um, I haven't sold that many books over the years. The best source that I've had for selling books has been the uh, uh, Grimsby Ways Goose. Jacob Quinlan in Peterborough has some of my books. Robert Wright has some of my books. Uh, I can't think of any other booksellers right now who have. I have a very difficult situation in that uh, I'm going to have to clean up my workshop um, because I'm moving into this basement at the end of the year. So everything is in a state of flux. As soon as I'm able to pull everything together, I'll try to do an inventory. If some people want to take chances and uh, contact me directly, I'll see what I can do. But probably for the next few months, I won't be selling books directly. Uh, as I say, Jacob Quinlan and uh, Robert Wright are, are good sources. Great. That's Robert Wright books in Tamworth, Ontario. And uh, Jacob Quinlan in Peterborough. Fantastic, and uh, and also just a reminder again to the uh, the exhibition that has opened with the uh, at the Grimsby Public Art Gallery, featuring uh, your work, Will, uh, curated by Chester. Uh, thank you both for taking the time to uh, to have the conversation today. This was this was just great. Um, thank you very much for asking me. Okay. I'm very honored to have been here. <laughs> yes, it's been lots of fun.
Yeah. We have uh, we have some uh, events that are coming up in May, uh, virtual events. We actually have two uh, to to discuss. Now the uh, the first one is Thursday, May twelfth, and this one's at a special time because uh, the, the person that will be featured is is based in Germany, and that's Caroline Salzfettel. And that will be at 9 p.m. Pacific time. So we'll be putting an announcement through about that, but that's uh, Thursday, May 12th at 9 p.m. And then uh, another event at the end of the month in May, Thursday again, May 26th, and that will be at 5 p.m. Pacific. It will be George Walker, and he'll be talking about his most recent book on Mary Pickford. So uh, lots to look forward to, and we have some other uh, other events coming up. So keep an eye on the social media platforms as well as our website. And again, thank you both for taking the time to have this conversation. This was this was an absolute delight. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, All the best. Happy <laughs> yes.